What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Paranormal Print of Rabbit Hole. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? So what's going on, Mr. Decker? How are you doing? Oh, doing all right. It's a hot and muggy night up here in Appalachia Mountains. The crickets are loud and noisy, and I am ready for an epic episode tonight. Oh. Yeah, so are we, Mr. Thomas, and everybody else is tuning in. Welcome to the show. So what we got cooking tonight? All right. Tonight we're going to talk about a couple of different subjects that have been uh, around in the cryptid world. If you're on social media, you've heard these terms a lot. We're going to discuss the Wendigo, and we're going to discuss the Skinwalker. All right. We're going to get to the bottom of what these guys really are and what they're not because there's a lot of information out there and a lot of the information is just not accurate to what these creatures historically are and so i got a guest with us tonight that is the go-to guy when it comes to these two creatures and uh, he's going to give us the lowdown on what exactly a skinwalker is and what exactly a wendigo is and what they're not all right, and who is this guy that you're bringing on? We are bringing on none other than Ryan Tremblay tonight. My good All buddy, right. Ryan. Ryan, come on down, brother. Come on. In. Welcome, welcome. How are you doing there? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you. That was a hell of an intro, Justin. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Not a problem. And it's, it's nothing but the truth, man. I, I know whenever I have uh, those kind of issues, you're the guy to go to for sure. Oh, man, that flatters me, man. Thank you. There's Ashley. Not a problem. Not a problem. Hey, Rebecca. Got a full house in here tonight. Yeah, they're starting to stack oh, up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we got a little, some, some uh, night owlers out here. Absolutely. That's great. Hey, Thomas. So tell us all about yourself. Well, I am a avid monster hunter and monster geek. I love all things that have to pertain to monsters. You know, you name it, Godzilla movies, Gamera movies. I'm there for it all the time. Cryptids are my big thing, especially, you know, things like Skinwalkers, Wendigo. Those are my forte, so to speak. And that's what I really specialize in studying as I focus on those things to bring the native lore to light so everybody knows the facts and not the stuff that you hear in a creepypasta videos. That makes sense, yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I'll let you take so, it away. Ryan, let me ask you. We got it. We're going to start with this one, guys. So, do we consider skinwalkers... Well, let, let's start with Wendigo first. So, the Wendigo. Is the Wendigo a cryptid? By definition of what a cryptid is, would we consider no. a Wendigo a cryptid? No. no. And why not? not? I'll tell you why. Because a cryptid, by definition, is an animal. It's an animal that is rumored to exist, but we can't verify its existence yet. The Wendigo is not an animal by any means. It's an entity. It's a spirit that will possess a human being when certain cultural taboos have been broken. The most famous being cannibalism, but you know, also greed, lust, anger. All those things can invoke the spirit of the Wendigo. And that's a word we need to focus on, Justin. The spirit of the Wendigo. Not the furry, stag-headed monster running around in the woods that people like to see. No, no, no. It's a spirit. It's an entity. Hey, Keith. Are you there, Decker? Yep, I'm here. I'm just having trouble with my audio for some reason. Hey, we'll talk like So I got to say, there's always something, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Here he <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm getting the, the robotic break up here. I don't know if we just uh, atmospheric interference or what's going on. Um, so yeah, basically, the, I mean, definition. I've got no rain here, so it might be on your side, but I don't know uh, if the audience can hear you. That's the important thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. loud and clear on our side. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so. Th- the definition of a cryptid, like you said, is specifically it's it's a biological animal, 
right? Mm-hmm. Cryptozoology is the study of hidden and unknown animals, and a cryptid right. is a subject of cryptozoology. Therefore, by very definition, a cryptid has a biological animal. Whether yes. either considered extinct or never been recognized by science, it's basically an animal reported mm-hmm. to exist that either shouldn't exist or is thought to be extinct and shouldn't exist anymore. So that's by very definition what a cryptid is. And in right. and, and this day and age, that definition is getting muddled a lot. Yeah. And, and people are pretty much, well, yeah, they're, they're basically any monster nowadays or entity that has a physical form is being called a cryptid. Right. I mean, look at things like the Slender Man. You know, Slender Man's being called a cryptid, and that's not a cryptid by any means. Yeah, that's a, that's a right, creepy Right, right. If it were to exist, that would be a spiritual entity. That wouldn't be a cryptid. It's not an animal. So Slender Man wouldn't even be right. a cryptid itself. Okay, so, um, so by, by very definition, what we're talking about is not cryptids. It's definitely something that falls in the paranormal yeah, uh, 14 yeah. realm of the kind of stuff that we study, for sure, right? Mm-hmm. So oh, as yeah. I was telling you pre-show, I first heard about the Wendigo when I was in eighth grade a long time ago. And there was a brief story in my lit- my literary arts book in eighth grade. And it really didn't go into what a Wendigo was. It was just talking about a Wendigo as um, an evil spirit of the North. It mm-hmm. is basically how the book portrayed it, the story portrayed it. Um, right. And he, I did do my own digging into the Wendigo. So I'm going to give you what well, my idea of what a Wendigo is. And then you come back and tell me everywhere that I'm wrong. Okay. Fire <laughs> okay. right. away. So my understanding of a Wendigo is, is a Wendigo is a spirit that travels the Northern wastelands, the woods, things like that. And they're invoked when a person basically turns to cannibalism. Now the stories that I have heard specifically referencing a Wendigo would be like, um, a, a cabin or a village, up in the woods got isolated because of a snowstorm or, you know, something like that where nobody could have access to them. They didn't have any food coming in or out and an individual within that community turned to cannibalism. And then the spirit of the Wendigo came onto them and then they physically transformed into a Wendigo. Um, And then this became a, a preternatural entity and it had, you know, certain attributes where um, they were always starving. Their, 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 their hunger could never be satiated, no matter how much human flesh could it consume. Right. Um, they're associated with extreme cold. So if you are in the presence of an entity, you feel extreme cold. Um, they, they have different types of supernatural powers, whether to either hypnotize you or you essentially kind of lull your senses where you're not really aware of what's going on until it's too late. And then right. from there, they basically uh-huh. just wander the North woods. Um, and I keep saying the North woods because that's specifically what it's attributed to is the cold and, and right. the dark and, and the fear of the unknown in the, in those areas. And then when they happen upon somebody, if they are able to ensnare them, then they go ahead and devour them as well. Does that right. sound about right? Or, yeah, okay. that's uh, very, very that's, accurate. In fact, the, um, the cabin story... That's the that I think extent about, of my knowledge. <laughs> mm-hmm. The cabin story that I think you're kind of uh, hearing here is the story of Swift Runner. That one is very much in line with the Wendigo. In fact, they will tell you he was a Wendigo at one point. And that whole story, I don't know if you guys right. are familiar with Swift Runner. Do you guys know about that one? Or do you want me to tell you that story? Yeah, please, please. Okay, well, Swift Runner... Go right was, into it, man, because... All right. Well, he was a he was a Cree hunter and fur trader. So he he had been out in the territory plenty of times, and he went on a trip with his family, with his mom, with his wife, his mother in law, and his two kids. Okay, and he went to a cabin that he normally stayed at upon this route that he went when he was hunting. Well, he came back about three weeks later, and he said how they were all dying from starvation. But the funny thing is, guys, Swift Runner looks like he had gained weight. Okay, so for somebody talking about starvation and he's gaining weight, they're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And they became very suspicious of this guy. So the magistrates and some people from the tribe had Swift Runner take him back to the cabin. When they walked to the cabin, they found the bodies of his entire family, his mother-in-law, his wife and his kids. 
And very nonchalantly, he walked over picking up the skulls and he would say, oh, this was my wife. This was my mother-in-law. Then he would go into the story of how he killed them, how he ate their flesh and how he cracked open the bones to get the marrow. And so they knew something was wrong with this guy. And he started claiming he was possessed by the Wendigo. He was taken over by the Wendigo. And with the Algonquins and the Cree, when you say, I'm the Wendigo, it starts a fear chain reaction. Everybody's afraid. All the local villages will freak out. So they put him in jail. They arrested this guy. And he even told a French cardinal who was there, a French uh, monk, that he was the Wendigo. That it wasn't his control that killed these the family, that killed the people. It was the Wendigo that came over him and made him so hungry that he feasted upon his family. So they executed him eventually, and they were so convinced that he was a Wendigo that when he died, they cut up his body and they took different body parts and placed it in different areas within Canada. Nobody knows where he's buried to this day. Wow. So there's something to wow. that. That's a really dark story. So that is actually not the story that I've ever heard. It's a totally different story. And so the, the, the parallels are astounding. Um, mm -hmm. I remember the, the story that I was recalling was specifically a small community of maybe five or six families. And, mm -hmm. but basically the same thing happened where they couldn't get supplies. And eventually when they got in there, they found a specific individual who, who was a fur trapper, right. um, but was responsible for, for killing pretty much everybody in the village. Mm -hmm. But then if, I've, if I'm recalling correctly, he kind of disappeared into the wilderness itself. Um, but the same, the same basic kind of story, you know, they, they were uh, locked away, no supplies. They couldn't get to them. They were snowed in and then the cannibalism ensued and that kind of stuff. So it, it's amazing. So they think this is a real phenomenon, a real spirit, a real entity. And that's what you're saying, right? Like this is not okay. just, you know, oh, yeah. This isn't Thank just a ghost story saying, hey, be prepared for winter. This is actually a legitimate oh. thing. Yeah, I mean, they are so terrified of it, Justin, that when they hear certain noises out in the woods during the winter, they're convinced this is the, the wail of the Wendigo, that it's the cry of the approaching Wendigo, and that someone's going to be possessed that winter. They're just that terrified of it. I mean, it's something that even you say its name, and it sends a cold mm -hmm. shiver of fear to these people. To them, it's very, very real. To them, it's as real as Bigfoot is to you and I. Sure. You know, so when you talk about it, they just get so frightened. They'll lock themselves in. They won't speak to anybody if they think there's a one to go about. It's very, very real. To them. Now, okay. I actually had a now, guy on one of my shows that back in the 70s, he was a fur trapper. Mm -hmm. And he just came out in the open uh, not too long ago in one of the Facebook groups. And he claimed he had a one to go experience. Oh, yeah. And he never went back in the woods again. And uh, I mean, he literally he has nightmares to this day. Yeah, he literally cried on the show and he got oh. crucified in 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 this Facebook group. And he came to me and he was telling me and I'm like, yeah, I believe you, man, because there's crap that walks around this earth that people don't believe in that exists. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I was like, man, I said, how about you come on my show and tell you tell me your story? And he was like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. Not the way I, I got <laughs> treated. And it, wow. it took him two or three months and he finally came on. And uh, and he had a real rough time telling his story. And he said the screech and the screaming that mm -hmm. it that it made and the eyes, the red eyes and how tall it was. And it was in Virginia. And, wow. and he said it was uh, he said that no matter how fast he ran to get away from this thing, it was like it was it, it just glided down through the hills. Mm. And uh, and he was uh, up in a hollow right down at, to, at the bottom where it was a graveyard. And oh. he and he didn't know that allegedly he was on sacred land. Oh, trapping boy. animals for for hot yes back then Ooh, ouch so uh yeah and he, still to this day he does not go into the woods he still has a rough time talking about it and that uh, it, it, it's really messed him up yeah i mean that makes sense because you know they even in the old folklore they say that the scream the wail of the wendigo can drive people insane that it gets them so filled with fear that they go insane from this fear that's being planted inside of them you know he so said, i would yeah, he said he'll never forget the way it, it screeched and screamed. 
I bet. In the way, in the way it just echoed through that valley. You know, Ooh. it was just awful. Mm. So I never want to experience something like that. I don't. <laughs> no, no, me either. I mean, I love the Wendigo, but I want to run into one. <laughs> well, no. and, and let's look at the context. This guy is, a, a you said, a fur trapper, basically a trapper and a hunter. And mm, yeah. he probably spent most of his life out there in the woods, right? And so yeah, he's familiar yeah. with because every, everybody's going to say, yeah, everybody's going to say, you know, screech owl or it was a mountain lion or all that other oh, no. crap that we oh, hear. No. But no, if this no. guy spent his life in the woods. And I've, if anybody understands what a fur trapper does, they spend weeks alone in the woods. It's what they do. Yep. They have a They have yep. a trap line and they go through the area and they hit all their traps and they reset them and they spend a substantial time alone in the woods, you know, overnights and all that kind of stuff. Right. So he, this guy's familiar with the sounds of the woods. He's going to know what owls sound like and how they behave. Yeah, and he's going to be familiar with the cats with and the foxes and, and right. all this other stuff. I mean, I mean, yeah. the way he described it to me, I mean, when I was even talking to him verbally yeah, at first, you know how you interview people, right. Just to make sure. Oh, yeah. You're going to, I mean, he was having problems getting words together. And I'm like, man, this guy's telling wow. me the truth. Yeah. I he mean, it's, it, yeah, but he sure did. And like I said, it took him a few months just to get him to come on the show. And when he did come on the show, he had to bring his daughter with him for comfort. Whoa. Yes. Whoa. Okay. Yes. Wow. So this so gave the, him more credence. Yes. Let me, let me ask you this, Grizz. What about the encounter? made him label it a wendigo uh basically the antlers the 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 height the red eyes and the way that it flew the it, when he said flew it when it came down over the hill he thinks because the animal that was in the trap making the noise that was still mm -hmm. alive attracted mm -hmm. it and evidently he was in an area he wasn't supposed to be and that's why right. he thought, I think he said sacred land. So, mm. and maybe it was Indian sacred land. I don't know. He doesn't know. But, you know, back then, hell, man, you used to go in the woods and set up traps anywhere in Virginia, right? I mean, he was a yeah. trap. Yeah. And he was a country boy. I mean, you set up 15, 20, 30 traps, didn't think nothing of it. It's not like it is today. Name, license, address, phone number on the trap. I mean, you set them right, up, and, right. like, and like and like Brian said, you go out, and run them, and 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 set them up, get them, and do them over again. Yeah. And he said when he was out there, and he heard this thing screech or whatever it did, he didn't know what it was at first. He was like, "What? What? You know?" And he freaked out. And he said when he looked up and he heard it again, he said it came over the ridge and stood there. And it made itself known, and it vibrated his body when it made that yell. And he said, right then and there, he was like, I knew, I never, he said, I didn't know what it was at first. He mm -hmm. said, I've never in my life seen it. And he said, it was not a Bigfoot. He said, it had mm -hmm. antlers, it was skinny, it was tall, and it was just lanky and lanky, and it was just evil looking. It's like the depths of hell was there. And yeah. it was just yeah. making this chaos noise. And when it came down, oh, it was it was like floating. It wasn't like running, it was like floating. Wow. You know, like it didn't have light. And that, and when he said that the red eye sockets, and he was like, I'm out of here. And the more the faster he ran. It seemed like it just chased him right out of the woods. Wow. And he, he left all of his traps. He never went back. And I don't know how much he said he lost. I don't traps blame him and that. stuff. But yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Man, yeah. I would have been out. And when, when did this supposedly happen? Uh, mid 70s. Mid 70s. Virginia. Okay. So yep. I already know where that, that Ryan and I are kind of on the same page with this one because of our past discussions now. Um, Ryan, the antlers, <laughs> Okay. the antlers so, on the Wendigo. Let's, let's talk about that. So this is, this is in no way in any attempt to discredit the gentleman that had this encounter. All we're doing is analyzing this from our perspective and our information. So I'm going to throw that out there to start with. All right. 
But yeah, Ryan, let's let's talk about the antlers. Let's talk about the antlers. All right. So in the original depiction of the Wendigo, there was never any antlers mentioned, okay? But I am going to maybe give this guy's story a little bit more credibility because what might have been mm-hmm. antlers were actually tree branches, okay? Because they say that Wendigo like to disguise themselves with elements of the forest, right? So tree branches and leaves mm-hmm. and debris from the first floor. So who's to say they wouldn't wear bl- branches on their heads to kind of blend in a little bit more when they're ducking down? So maybe it's not sure. antlers that he saw, but tree branches. It could be. We have reports of Bigfoots yep. wearing skulls with antlers. Right. We yep. have Bigfoots wearing branches. So mm-hmm. it, it could be. You yeah. know, I wasn't there. I, yep. I mean, he saw something, and I believe him. I mean, that. I mean, yeah, exactly. I, I, that, exactly. that is a possibility. Absolutely. I could buy that. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not trying to discredit him. I think I'm trying to give him more weight to his nope. story by saying there are tree branches, you know, because it would blend in to the forest a lot easier if it was wearing tree branches. Sure. So, you know, maybe that's now, what it was. I, I'm of the belief, and, and this is a rabbit hole, and this is just my own personal opinion, so take it for what you will, guys, that okay. there are or there is or are an entity or entities that live in the wild places in the woods that mm-hmm. take on the appearance of something that we would fear. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, like and, and I know, well, not necessarily a Tulpa because a Tulpa is a, a thought projection from our own mind. Mm-hmm. Um, this is going to be really far out there. Okay. But there was an episode of the X-Files. Okay. Oh yeah. And the entire the entire episode of the X Files, the, there was something terrorizing a neighborhood, but every person that came across it experienced something different. Yep. Right. So one house saw Freddy Krueger. One ha- or one group of people saw what they called the the Wasp Man or the Bee Man, which was a story from their childhood. Um, And all these different kinds of things. But the end of the premise was it was the same entity and it found fears in their minds and basically became what they feared. Mm -hmm. And then I, I am starting to believe that such an entity or entities are out there that have that capability. And I think some of the most terrifying Okay, it's, it's, it's a great episode. It's shot on like handy cam documentary footage style. It's, it's really cool. Um, but there's been a lot of stories that just don't kind of fit, whether it becomes mm-hmm. with Bigfoot or, or different things that, that have the folklore element of a story, like, like antlers, right? But we know traditionally that's not how they look, but it's how the modern man views the story. And so that's why I was kind of wondering right. what the time frame was. Because I don't know if, like, the concept of a Wendigo with antlers was around in the 70s or not. But, I mean, potentially this could have been an entity where it came across this guy. And there was, you know, he heard the wailing and the fear. And when it finally interacted with him, it became a conglomeration of stuff that this guy feared in the first place to chase him out. So, So just just a thought. Let's put a biblical reference on this, right? So we know okay. the Denami, right? Demons, Denami, yep. right? Denomic yep. value. They will take right. Ryan's fear, right? And take whatever his fear is and manipulate that and turn that into an image. So that can happen. So mm-hmm. that is plausible right. and feasible. That can happen. Sure. So yes. Sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, think but about I just it. wanted to throw that out there. Too, when we think of yeah, demons, absolutely. we always think that they have really big horns and everything. So, yep. Yeah. I, I just think that's a very fascinating thing to consider, especially when we have the, these experiences yeah, the of people. Yeah. Like, like this guy obviously had a very real experience, like without a doubt. You know, if he's showing those kind of physical responses, even just talking about a story that happened. I mean, what, 50 years ago. And if he's, if he's viscerally reliving that and, and needed somebody to come along, I mean, he experienced something 100% absolutely real to him, without a doubt. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you and, know where the pitch can come I, from. 
is uh you guys ever read algernon blackwood's book the one to go no i haven't uh, uh excerpts of it but i've never read the whole thing uh excerpts of it i have all right well if you look at the cover justin how was the wendigo depicted it had red eyes it was yep. a giant and, and it had antlers. well it, it had almost so, like an elk skull for a head right because it, it wasn't just antlers it was like a huge rat oh audio's breaking up again that's a glimpse of that book and you thought right uh oh so i am actually uh in it, let's see here so while he's breaking up and he's going to come back in i'll bring there i'm is. back he's now back. i can hear you good yep okay. i'm back go ahead the, the joys of living in the woods. <laughs> right? Yeah, so basically, the, 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 like you were saying, the cover of that book pretty much has become like the iconic image of what people think of as a Wendigo. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, you know, that was around for a long, long time, Justin. So that was okay. available in the 70s. It's possible okay. he saw that book cover somewhere and just, you know, never dawned on him. And then when he saw his Wendigo out in the woods... There you go. It would look like Algernon Blackwoods, right? If it's following your theory that, at all, it's like something taken on the form of his fear, you know? Sure. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I recall reading that there is or was at least up to a few decades ago a professional Wendigo hunter. Yes. You know Jack about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And this guy actually... I don't. I forget the number, but claimed to have hunted and killed multiple Wendigos. Yeah, yeah, he had different methods. One of his methods actually was using violence. He would beat the Wendigo out of the person that was possessed. Wow! And, yeah, <laughs> he'd, he'd show up and just start beating the holy hell out of this poor person to get the spirit to detach from the human body. You know, and it's not just him that did it though. His family before him did it, and then once right. he died his sons carried on the tradition of hunting Wendigo. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was West Virginia, 1978, right there around around 1979, he said. Okay. 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 So, yes. Hey, Paul, I just, or, um, sorry, my brain's a little fried tonight. Uh, Grizzly, Ashley Hilt asked a question there in the chat. Can you pull that up for us? I want to dissect that a little bit. Who was it? Ashley. There we go. Hey, Ashley. Um, what other phenomenon are you referring to? Hmm. Ryan, do you know what she's talking about? I don't. This one's interesting. I'm actually uh, excited to see what she says about this. Oh, I thought she was referring to the one I was referring to. That's why I had to went back and looked up to his, his notes. That he was yeah, that was, on me. So another Come on, Ashley, bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> For I those of you who don't know, Ashley is another 14 researcher out there. I've met Ashley. The Whitefield UFO flap. Okay. 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 That's Thanks, Ashley. Um, I mean, it, was that in the late, the late 70s there? Wow. Uh, Brian... No, Wendigo doesn't yeah. actually match the comic book version at all. It's actually the total opposite. Marvel made this <laughs> huge furred monstrosity that had muscles and everything. The Wendigo is a total opposite. Picture a human being, but they're emaciated. They're chewing their fingertips. They're chewing their own lips. Some cases, they're bald, and they have pale, 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 chalk white skin. So Marvel did the total opposite of what the Algonquins were talking about. Okay, so looking at that description, Ryan, that almost sounds like what we would refer to as a pale crawler. Yeah, yeah. right. And it's, I, I, it's yeah, it's interesting though. If you look at the pale crawler folklore in some of the native tribes, okay, they're called the people before the people. So, mm -hmm. pale crawlers, these pale humanoids, either they were a tribe that was there before the other initial tribes, or they were some kind of people that were there when the tribes arrived. Okay. And according to the native folklore, these people before the people got tired of humanity and they just abandoned any civility at all and just took to living underground. 
And they say this is why they developed the white, white skin, the black eyes that sometimes glowed when the lights hit it, didn't have mm-hmm. any hair on their body, and they became very aggressive because they became subterranean humans. So I wonder if ultimately if there's a connection in there and just what we're hearing about the Wendigo is an interpretation of their perspective or their experiences with these same kind of creatures. I think it could be a lot of them will tell, you no, the Wendigo and these pale humanoids are two different anomalies, but then Uh some will tell you it's possible that, you know, these are the ones that became the Wendigo. So, and then we know, over time, a lot of this folklore is going to kind of blend together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? It all bleeds together sooner or later. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. I never, never thought of that aspect of before, and that's why this is the rabbit hole, right? Because we can go and and ask right. those questions and make those thoughts and see what's going on. Right. And that's what you okay, guys. So we stuff. So. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So basically, what we've established with the Wendigo, it's a cannibalistic spirit. Mm-hmm. Now, can the can the spirit exist and be an active Wendigo, so to speak, outside of a human host? Or does it have to be in a human and then they transform the human to be able to carry on its deeds? Or can it do okay. it without it? So the best way I can explain this is there's two versions of the Wendigo. There's the Wendigo, and that's the, the spirit that's all-encompassing, okay? And then okay. you have a Wendigo. A Wendigo is when somebody gets possessed. Now, with the Wendigo itself, it can cause fear, it can cause panic and chaos, but it can't do anything physically. Now, once somebody's okay. broken those taboos or somebody's been cursed to become a Wendigo or somebody's had dreams of a Wendigo, which are called Poaganok. When they're having dreams, it's called a Poaganok. It's a, it's a dream spirit. So once somebody starts having these dreams, okay. that's when the Wendigo can start influencing our world. Okay, It can make that person that's having the dreams do some really chaotic and evil stuff. But it does require a human vessel to actually start physically doing things. So is this okay. where the dynamic comes into play? Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Mm-hmm. So right. a Wendigo is not another name for Bigfoot, correct? Uh, yes and no. Okay. When it comes to Wendigo being called, <laughs> Bigfoot being called Wendigo, it's in the spelling, Justin. It's all in the spelling. W I D. W I N D I G O. Windigo. Okay. It's pronounced different. You have Wendigo, then you have Windigo. Windigo is a name for Bigfoot in the states of like Maine and Massachusetts. And they call it Windigo because these Bigfoot are believed to be aggressive. They're believed to eat people. So when they saw this okay. thing, they believed it too was a Windigo. So they thought it was like another type of Windigo or just something yeah. in the same family. And so they gave, but they differentiate between the two based on the spelling and the pronunciation, probably pronunciation, right? Because right. spelling wasn't a huge thing until we came around. So right. they were able to differentiate between the two. It wasn't a confusion. It wasn't a catch all name. It was just something where it was similar to it. So therefore yes. it has a similar name. Okay. See, and I didn't know that. that that's, that's great. That's good information to remember. Cause I'm yeah, always I, one of these guys that goes, you're, you're, why are you calling Bigfoot a Wendigo? That doesn't make any sense because that's not what it is. But I will have to be a little more cautious on that route for sure. Yeah, just look at the spelling though, Justin. You know, like don't call it the Wendigo. Wendigo. Right. Wendigo. You know, like you W-I-N-D. That way yep. when you're you know, referring to the Bigfoot type, it's the Wendigo. It's the Wendigo. Okay. Awesome. That is good. I did not know that at all. Yep. Now you know. Knowing's half the battle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, Brian was asking if a Wendigo possesses someone. Yeah, there you go. Does it take a shaman to remove it? Is it like a curse? It can like, be. Can it, it, be, be, can it be removed other than beating the literal hell out of somebody? Yeah, actually, it's funny because one of the most common things used when somebody's becoming Wendigo is heated beef tallow. That's beef fat. They believe that uh-huh. by feeding somebody who's gone Wendigo this hot fat, you're melting the ice of the heart of the Wendigo. So that will release its hold on the person. So, you know, that's one way they can stop it. Another way is by using a silver dagger. You know, if you inject somebody with a silver dagger, that's set to dry over as well. Yeah. So is it too late to stop the transformation into a Wendigo? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. 
And in most cases, yeah, it would have to be a shaman that does it because he would have what you really need. And he would have to do some right. special dance and he'd have to say some special words to really drive that one to go away. But yes, it right. can also be the curse. There's a story, a couple of stories actually, where a man in the tribe, a chief, was in love with this young woman, but her family did not approve. Her mother and father kept saying, no, you're not good enough for her. Go away. So being a jilted lover, he put a curse on the entire family. Well, her mother had just given birth maybe, you know, a few months ago. And her mom was asleep in her chambers with her youngest child asleep on her breast. So this girl thought nothing of it because her mom was sleeping late. She just thought her mother was tired. And it was time to try to get her up. So she kept calling her mom's name, calling her mom's name. Mom wasn't responding. So she goes into the mom's room and she notices that the mom is a very unusual color. She's not moving. Doesn't look like she's breathing. She pulls back the blanket and her youngest sibling is feasting on her mom's chest. She's The baby's literally eating the mom's chest away. So this man had cursed the baby to become a Wendigo to get revenge on that family. Wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, the hot beef tallow thing, are we talking like boiling hot oil being forced and poured down their throat? Or are we talking where... It's not actually going to damage the host once the Wendigo the, the Wendigo spirit is is gone. Well, it depends. Or do, they, the, do they specify? It depends on the situation. If it's you know early in the process, it could be something that they eat voluntarily. You know, you make a soup for them and they down it voluntarily. Right. I would imagine in extreme cases that yeah, they would you know force the mouth open and pour that stuff down their throat. I would imagine it would go to that. Yeah. Sure, but what it what I'm what I'm guess what I'm saying is it would be hot enough to cause physical damage, like like yeah, oh yeah, bubbling, I mean, searing gonna, oil that yeah, we fry be, food in, getting poured down their throat. Right, it would have to be. It would have to be that scolding hot. Yeah. Wow. You no know, thanks. You're, you're trying to melt the <laughs> heart of the Wendigo, so they're trying to you know break the freeze, the cold hold that the Wendigo has over that individual. So. So basically one of the only ways to get rid of a Wendigo spear once it's got a good hold of you is extreme is going to cause extreme physical pain, right? So either you're getting the tar beat out of you or they're pouring the scalding hot oil down your throat. Right. Or they're killing you. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's essentially a death sentence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they'll even dig somebody's heart out, you know, and they believe they're Wendigo. They believe you have to take a dagger and pierce the ice that's on the heart to kill the Wendigo. Then you have to dig out the heart, burn that heart, put the ashes in a silver box, and bury that box in holy ground. So essentially, the way to exercise the Wendigo spirit, you end up having to kill the host in a specific way. Yeah. That's how much they fear this. Wow. I think it's it's their version of the exorcist, I think. That's what it always seemed like to me. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, and that that's where I, the idea of this being uh, a specific type of like demonic spirit is really drawing parallels here. If you yeah. look into um, a, a lot of other folklore or stories or even Catholic, you know, tradition on how to perform exorcisms of extreme cases, you know, a lot of times the host is destroyed in, in, yeah. in the situation. Not always. And like you Most said, a lot of it depends on, on it, but fascinating. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. As for that question from Brian, I mean, well, I'm going to give you something to think about, Brian. People say that Bigfoot's part human, right? That there's a lot of <laughs> traits they have that make them human-like. Well, if they're human-like, why can't they get possessed? Imagine that, a Wendigo possessed Bigfoot. Ouch. <laughs> so we know, yeah, that... reference, that animals can be possessed. Yeah, correct. Yeah, absolutely. The herd of swine. Yeah, so I mean, absolutely. if the animals can be the best, then why can't Bigfoot, you know? Sure. Sure, absolutely. Wow. And then, so with the Wendigo, are, are the, the natives afraid to discuss them and talk about them? It, yes. Like, can you bring it on to them about that? Or is it just more of a a reverence of fear if we don't talk about that or, or do they actually fear that this could attract the attention of a Wendigo and bring them around? I'm so glad you asked that because a lot of people will tell you, Oh, they won't speak of it because it brings a Wendigo. 
Not true. Not true. It's a reverence of fear. They don't want to say okay. something that disrespects the spirit because if they disrespect that spirit, they believe that disrespect will bring it on. Now, if they're talking respectfully about it, they're not so terrified to even speak its name. Now, this okay. whole thing of being afraid to talk about certain things, that stems more from the Skinwalker than it does the Wendigo. Again, that's the amalgamation of two totally different lores. Uh-huh. Once and again, then the biblical reference, just like mm -hmm. pastors, reverends, and priests. They do not want to talk about the evil mm -hmm. because they don't want to you know, sanctify that. They do not want to sure. manifestation of that right. evilness, right. right? They want to talk about purity mm -hmm. and joy yeah. and love. But anyway. Yeah. And one of the things I find fascinating about that concept is all around the world in different cultures, different religious beliefs, the mentioning of evil attracts the attention of the evil. Uh, mm -hmm. Like like a beacon or, or like a whisper on the wind that's calling its name. And I've seen this in, in uh, modern day popular books that invoke the fae and the fairy and monsters and things like that. Yeah. Um, to the point of like, you know, calling uh, their name three times summons them uh, to, to Native, Native American lore and legend about not mentioning certain creatures because it, it gets their attention. I, I think that's fascinating. And to me when you have a phenomenon that's that widespread culturally and globally, I think you have to say there's something to it because we're, they're, they're not going to come up with the same concept on their Very own. True. Very true. It's something yeah. they have to experience. And so I think that in and of itself kind of ties a lot of this phenomenon together. If, if nothing yeah. else, but saying it's part of that same realm so to speak but without having a better name for it you know yeah i agree interesting so are are there any commonalities between the wendigo of native american lore and, and maybe something out of european fairy lore or or you know celtic lore or anything like that are, are there any other parallels with a wendigo um, I think really the only parallels we can draw nowadays, Justin, are the uh, physical descriptions because a lot of people took Norse mythology and they mixed it with the Algonquin Wendigo lore. That's actually where you get the stag-headed Wendigo because they took a Norse god okay. and placed it in the Wendigo category when originally it had nothing to do with the Wendigo at all. But the Wendigo is really more of a unique thing. It's like, you know, it's that one thing that belongs truly to the Algonquin and the Cree and the Ojibwe. There's not much to find in common with other cultures at all. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome, man. I've learned so much about the Wendigo. Uh, just, just talking from you and I thought I was pretty well versed on it. So I'm really glad we're having this discussion because I really want to clear the air. Right. With, with a lot of the people out there. Cause like we said at the beginning, there's so much misinformation out there. Yeah. You yep. know, That's about okay. what it is and what it isn't. And one of the things, like I said, that frustrates me is when people are using the wrong names for the wrong things and then yeah. it gets categorized the wrong way and then it adds to the lore of something it shouldn't be adding to. And then it builds up over time. Yeah, I mean, you get to see how disrespectful it is, too. You know, when everybody's taking and adding all mm -hmm. this other stuff to Native American folklore, you're going, why are you doing this? Why are you adding your own yeah. elements? They have such a rich history already laid out before us. I, I don't understand the concept of doing that. Right. So, Catherine, okay. what is the difference between a Wendigo and a shapeshifter? Okay. Shapeshifters can take right. on any form they want. You know, it's almost limitless. Whereas the Wendigo, when it possesses a human, it's stuck in that shape you know it's only going to become that human it can't alter its shape to fit whatever it wants it can't become an animal or anything like that it's just it's it is itself that's it and we got shane here shane brother shane there you go yeah yep there's shane we're gonna get him on one of these days oh. <laughs> um to, to me a shapeshifter isn't an entity a shapeshifter is an ability mm-hmm Right. So I think right. multiple things can be shapeshifters. So 
And I've heard shapeshifter used to name something. Yeah. And and I don't think that's correct. It, it, it's an ability. It's an attribute. It's not a name. Right. It's a skill. It's a skill set. It's not just a, uh, an individual. So sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. You're there welcome. You go. Awesome. All <laughs> right. So. Great questions, guys. This is what I love, man. Our audience always has some amazing questions to come up with for it. Yeah, some um, good ones here. So the other thing I'm finding very interesting is your mention of silver of a silver dagger mm -hmm. needed. Um, and we know silver is an element that is used in a lot of, of killing of entities, uh, werewolves and different things like that. And, yes. and my studies have shown the reason it's always silver is because silver itself is a healing agent. It kills, um, basically, it's a natural antibiotic. Yeah, it kills totally fungus as an antifungal and antibiotic and uh, antiparasitic. So mm -hmm. I find it fascinating the use of silver to essentially heal these maladies. I, I wonder if it's a, a legitimate thing that it has to be silver or is it because cultures knew that silver had healing properties where in other cases where traditional medicines or herbs and, and, and tonics and tinctures weren't able to healing, if they could mm -hmm. use silver in the healing process, they'd actually be able to do it. So I've always wondered if the silver itself really did something in these extreme cases, like, like in defeating a Wendigo. What do you think about that? I think it played a very big role because silver is a pure metal. Okay. And the, even the ancients knew mm -hmm. that if you got an infection, the best way to clear that infection was to pierce your body with pure silver. And I do think there's a lot of merit to that. I think today's medicine might laugh at it, but I really do think there is something to that. I honestly do. I mean, all these cultures, yeah. just, you know, werewolves can yeah. be stopped with uh, silver. Wendigos can be stopped with silver. There has to be something to that. We can't just look at it and scoff yeah. and go, oh, it's coincidence. It's all just fairy tale. We can't do that. We have to look into sure. that and go, okay, there's something really to this. And again, it's the cultural parallels, right? They're not going to come up with the same element. Why? If it was random, it should be whatever is their area, right? So gold or silver or uh, maybe turquoise or opals in Australia, right? Anything right. like that. But because it always comes across as silver, then I agree. That means there has to be something to that. With the Absolutely. being able to affect specific spiritual entities. Yeah. Yep. And even in places it's hard yeah. to find. Too. I mean, imagine trying to find pure silver in Canada during the winter. That that couldn't be easy to do, right? <laughs> so I mean, Not there has to be something like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Brian, no, the Wendigo. Well, that, that's a great question. Yeah, the Wendigo is active whenever it wants to be. If it wants to attack you mid morning, it's going to. If it wants to attack you late at night, it's going to. If it wants to attack you midday, it's also going to. <laughs> no time restrictions. Yeah, that guy All had right, his so uh, in the middle of the morning, mid morning, when he had his uh, encounter. So, yeah. I mean, I would think that it has like certain hours okay. of prefer, though, if it's stalking you. I think maybe if it was following you with the intention to kill you, it's going to use the cover of night for that. But I think if it's, you know, any other time, though, all day is fair game. Sure. So yeah. how, how would I go about identifying a person that has been possessed by the Wendigo spirit? Well, they'll be telling you, Justin. I mean, in a lot of the stories, when somebody <laughs> comes... When somebody becomes a Wendigo, they'll tell you, I am the Wendigo. And that is really the best way to start looking into that. You know, if somebody says, I'm a Wendigo, you have to watch them and see, do you start, you know, is your attitude changing? Is your personality changing? And if that's what's going on, then you can pretty much guarantee, oh, crap, I got a Wendigo on my hands. Okay. Is, is there any? Oh, go ahead. In that case, don't call me, Justin. Don't call me saying, hey, Ryan, I got a window. Okay, <laughs> right, quick. <laughs> hang up Come help me quick. out with that one. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about long-term? If somebody has been possessed long-term, is there any physical manifestations that you yeah. could potentially, like, cue on or see or, or, you know? Yeah, I mean, really late into the process, that's when they start changing their entire form. That's when they'll start losing their hair. 
They'll start losing weight, becoming very emaciated. They'll start chewing their own fingertips and they'll even chew off their own lips because they're so hungry. So if they start doing things okay. like that around you, Justin, you get a really big problem, brother. <laughs> now, then I need to beat the tar out of them basically at that point, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep, and don't call Ryan. Okay. Because Ryan yeah, no, Ryan doesn't live here. Bye. <laughs> Ryan's just going to hang up at that point. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. All right. All yeah. right. Brian, you got to understand that when the Wendigo takes a hold of a human being, that human isn't in control anymore. It's the Wendigo that's really pushing them to do everything. And it's manipulating them mentally, physically, emotionally. So they'll be aggressive. They'll make threats. They'll threaten to eat you. You know, they really don't care. It's because the Wendigo doesn't care. It figures once this vessel is gone, there's other vessels around me. You know, this one's expendable. Right, and then they can just find the, the next host for them. Okay. Right. All right, so the, the, the Wendigo comes from the northern tribes, right? Canada, uh, right. the northern U.S., Minnesota, those kind of places. All right. So the next, yeah. next creature... I don't want to say creature, I guess, entity I, I, is the skinwalker that we're going to discuss. Okay. Yes. Um, so by definition, see if I'm right on this one, just like we talked about the Wendigo. By definition, a skinwalker is going to be a shaman that has gone down the dark path of, of the shamanic rituals and shamanic learning. Mm -hmm. They have to perform very specific rituals to gain the power of shape-shifting. Yes, And a skinwalker can shapeshift into a variety of animals mm -hmm. depending on either the rituals or the, the, the pelts that they're choosing to use in the rituals. So Correct. they are a human that through dark magic for, you know, a reference point, dark magic has gained the ability to shapeshift. Yes. Correct. You nailed it. Okay. Okay. Yep. So that's the definition of a skinwalker. So a skinwalker is not a dog man. No, no, no. I mean, if okay. you look at the name, Justin, look at the name skinwalker, the Navajo uh -huh. name for skinwalker is Yi Naradushi. Okay. And when you take Yi Naradushi and you translate it into English, it means by all means on all fours he goes. Okay. Now dog man okay. is bi dog man's bipedal. Okay. Bigfoot yep. is bipedal. So if his name literally means by all means on all fours he goes, why are they bipedal then? It was never said in the Navajo lore that they became bipedal animals. No, 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 no. They became the actual right. Animal. And what they would do, right? They would, that's the point right there. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot that people are mistranslating about these skinwalkers and they're saying, Oh, a werewolf is a skinwalker. A Bigfoot's a skinwalker. And it's like, do you guys understand how much you're disrespecting the various tribes by saying this stuff? You're ignoring right. what they say to you. you. You ignore it and say, Oh, you're wrong. No, a dog man is a skinwalker when they're going, no, it's not. You know? And I think that's okay. Cool. Ew. So the idea is they, they physically transform into this animal. It's not just, a likeness of an animal. It's not just a uh, human with animalistic features. They literally right. physically transform into the targeted animal. So yeah. you really couldn't tell the difference. Let, let's say one wanted to turn into a coyote, right? Very common one is a coyote. Mm -hmm. You couldn't really tell that it was a skinwalker by looking at it. Is that correct? You could, but you would have to look at its eyes, okay? Because while they, okay. put a lot of, they put a lot of effort and a lot of power into turning into that animal, but for your example, like a coyote, all right, their magic is flawed. So they'll look like that coyote to an extent, but the coyote's eyes will look like a human's. Ah, so when there's always them, one thing left. Right. If you were to look at their eyes and you were to shine a light into their eyes, unlike normal coyotes, when that light hit the eyes, they would glow red. Okay, so mm -hmm. it'd be a human like eye that's glowing red on a coyote. So you're going to know, hey, hey, that's not a coyote. That's a skinwalker. And right. ironically, too, when they change back into animals or change back into humans, what would happen is they have almost animal like eyes in their human form. Okay, so 
say he were to turn into a coyote, okay, and then he turned back into his human form, he would be stuck with eyes that were coyote shaped. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And now, they, I they're selective go ahead. too. They're selective about the animals. The animals that they choose, they're always predatory animals, and there's a reason for that. In the Navajo mm -hmm. culture and Navajo religion, it's forbidden to wear the pelts of predatory animals because they're so highly revered. So things like the bear, the werewolf, the coyote, the mountain lion, those things are very much up on a pedestal. So a skinwalker wears those pelts as almost in a way of giving the middle finger to the spiritual beliefs of his own people. So that's why he'll wear the pelt of a mountain lion or a coyote and change into these animals. It's a way of rebelling against the religion. Right, which the rituals themselves to become a skinwalker are also kind of like the ultimate rebellion of what the shamanic, yes. I don't know if it's a religion, but the shamanic system is supposed mm. to be. It is definitely the black side, the black magic side of what, what shamanism truly is supposed to be. Yeah, it's called the witchery way, okay? And to the Navajo people, especially back in the day, it was a very, very important belief. It was very strict, and it was something that they devoted themselves to. So when mm -hmm. somebody decided to become a Yinatalushi, it was a major offense because they were taking the witchery way, and they were basically desecrating it every turn. And what mm -hmm. the witchery way was is they also used it to heal people. So these skinwalkers were using it for the complete and total opposite, like hurting people, killing people. And right. part of their initiation, one of the biggest things for their initiation is they had to kill a family member or commit incest with a family member. You know, so that's what they were trying to do to their own religious beliefs. Right. Now, mm -hmm. I, had, I had heard some people putting out that originally um, skinwalkers were a force for the good of the tribe. To yes. defend and protect and, and and do all this. So my, my question is, if you had to do these these horrible, dark things to become a skinwalker, was, was that still the case even back then to become a protector and a positive force for the tribe? You know, it's funny because you can't really get a lot of information on that. You know, they'll say that okay. there were some things they had to do. And I think when they were good, when the skinwalkers, before they fell to the dark side... I think they just did more incantations. They did the chants and the ceremonies. I think once they started getting corrupted, it was when they started adding the, you have to kill a family member or you have to do this. You know, I think when the, so the it, twist came, you know, the corruption came, corrupted details were added to it. So it sounds almost like originally to become a, a skinwalker, you had to be very strong in, in the shamanistic ways and know the right rit rituals and have the, ability and, and and power essentially to perform those and then maybe some people found a shortcut yeah and they're I using blood the magic for for a better term blood magic or you know something along the same essence of that to be able to do this without all the other stuff mm -hmm. i think that's what it was justin i think what happened is some people just really wanted that power so badly that they were looking for quicker avenues you know and they okay. found a, path, a little loophole and they saw that the dark form of this led to some powers, but you know, certain sacrifices had to be made. And I think these people sure. just didn't care. I think they were like, Hey man, you know, that's fine. And like Brian just put it, sounds like the Jedi versus Sith. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a lot like that. I think it is a lot like that, Brian. And that's a perfect analogy. Thank you. I think that, you know, they wanted the power so badly that they found shortcuts. Are, are there any stories currently of the good form of skinwalkers that are on the positive side without the no. any modern day like that? Or is it pretty much that that has been lost over time and now it's all just the, the negative side? It's just the negative. I think it got so deep and so corrupted that, you know, the good side just doesn't exist anymore. I think these Yi Natalushi found a way to just, you know, get rid of anyone that was the opposite of them. Wow. Mm -hmm. it's pretty scary stuff I mean there was even a, a murder I don't know if you ever heard of it in 1987 there was a murder of a young oh. woman her name was uh, Sarah Saganisto right and she was mm -hmm. found behind the hospital where she worked and a young man by the name of George Abney he was actually arrested he was convicted he was brought to trial 
But the defense, after speaking with Abney, they started saying a skinwalker was at play. And after looking into this girl's murder, they did find that on her body was a stick structure found upon her throat that actually had some graveyard grass on which George Abney had nothing to do with. He didn't work at this graveyard. He was nowhere near the graveyard the night that she died. So this little town in Arizona, Flagstaff, they really believed that a skinwalker killed this young girl, Sarah. And that was only in 1987. That wasn't that far back. Wow. Mm -hmm. So is are are, our skinwalkers only only tied to a specific tribe or a specific region or can they be any any tribe or like how does that work all right well different tribes have different beliefs in skinwalkers like the navajo have the yi Narudushi, okay uh-huh. cherokee have the raven mocker so there are different versions of the skinwalker but like we were saying earlier none of them take on the form of a dog man or a bigfoot or anything along those lines the raven mocker is just like it sounds a raven Okay. Say same basic ability or, or shape shifting as we talked about before, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are the shape shifters. Those are the shape shifters that somebody asked about earlier. Okay. Brian's got another. <laughs> <laughs> so if a tribe was desperate to be saved because they were wiped out, they can use the curse of a skinwalker as a last resort for vengeance. Yeah. I mean, they did. That's that's what happened a lot. A lot of these Navajo tribes here in Arizona, when they were being wronged, the skinwalker would come and start, you know, dealing with whoever wronged them. And even though that makes the skinwalker sound like a good guy, that skinwalker was getting rid of the problem just so it could go later cause the problems for the tribe. Right. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So the... The skinwalker itself is Navajo tradition, but the other tribe and regions have a similar uh, shamanistic ability that's tied in, into their, their shamanistic beliefs. So with a right. raven mocker, is that the same thing? Is it the same kind of evil kind of process of gain this ability, or are they more in a positive light? Oh, this one's negative, too. With a raven mocker, this usually shows up when somebody is dying. This certain entity known as a raven mocker has cho- chosen a dying person because it wants to feast upon their heart. And okay. what it'll do is it'll start hunting, haunting the dreams of this person. It'll start you know, messing with them mentally. And it'll drive them insane before they die. It makes the heart taste much better to them when it's filled with fear and pain. But it's still a, an individual transforming into a raven at the end. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Now, see, I've never heard of a raven mocker. So that's it's pretty dark, Justin. When you really get into the that, story, yeah, the I mean, mocker, like, wow. That that sounds sounds really dark. Okay, so Skinwalker. That name is famous, and it's becoming more s- mainstream because yes. of a particular location right? Skinwalker, Skinwalker Ranch. Ranch. So let's talk about Skinwalker Ranch. Now, I, I know the story of Skinwalker Ranch. I've followed it for years. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say from the beginning, but for as long as I've been researching stuff, I've been following Skinwalker Ranch. I never fully understood like, why are we calling it Skinwalker Ranch, except for the fact that supposedly the land was cursed by a skinwalker. Is that the only reason they're calling it Skinwalker Ranch? Yeah, I mean, I haven't really heard too many tales of them seeing the Yi Narayushi over there. I mean, the old curse, right. I mean, that seems kind of a weird reason to call it Skinwalker Ranch, but, you know, whatever, right? It makes money for them, so good on them, I guess. <laughs> sure. Yeah, see, I always find that odd because, I mean, definitely it's a, it's a place of high strangeness, but without a yeah, doubt, like- right? Mm-hmm. But I just thought it was weird because does does a skinwalker have um, additional like shamanic abilities that a regular shaman wouldn't have other than the transforming itself? Like, does it come with its own set of curses and own set of powers that another shaman oh. couldn't access? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Yinaralushi especially, they are very well known for their curses. When they curse somebody... They don't curse one generation, Justin. They curse an entire family for as many years as possible. And these curses can range from like killing your livestock 
to making the ground on your property go bitter, to poisoning your water, to even making you go insane throughout the years, you know, and they're really good at doing this stuff. They know what they're doing. And as far as powers go, they actually use a certain kind of powder that will make you very sick. It's called corpse powder. And this corpse powder is made from the dead bodies of infants. They'll grind up the bones. Oh, wow. Yeah, they'll grind up the bones of infants and create their corpse powder, which they use when they cast a curse on you. They don't have to throw it on you. They can throw it on your property. They can throw it on your home. Cast that mm -hmm. curse and your life is about to become hell. Wow. Mm -hmm. There is Ashley. Ashley. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know, like, you're talking about uh, the dog they couldn't kill, the giant wolf. Um, yeah. They, yeah. they shot it, the, the chunk fell off, and it, like, rotted in their hands. Um, and a fascinating story. Um, like I said, I, I love the Skinwalker Ranch. I love all the phenomenon that goes on there. So many rabbit holes in that place. I think there's a, just a multitude of things happening there. Um, yeah. yeah, ley lines, portals, vortexes, energy vortex. Um, I think there's a lot going on there for sure. Um, it's just always weird as, as why it was called Skinwalker Ranch. And the only connection, like I said, is the fact that the Skinwalker's curse was put upon the land. Like, like that's the only thing they ever right, referred right. to it. Yeah. Yep. And that's becoming so, really common, too. I mean, it seems like almost every place in the United States has a Skinwalker curse nowadays. Right, right. I mean, you got LBL and, that and, had it. Get all these other places, and it's like, when did curses become so popular? Well, and, and again, I think it, it's <laughs> it's the uh, the um the use of the word skinwalker being used in ways where it doesn't apply. Same right. thing. Yep. Right, because I mean, here here in Appalachia, this is Cherokee territory, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so according to what you're saying, this would be Ravenmocker territory, not necessarily Skinwalker territory. Right. So, right. let me ask ask you this question. Because I've, I've come across this in some popular writing. Is a skinwalker's power tied into its land? Like, yeah. if it goes beyond the Navajo land, does it lose it, its power or weakens a bit? It's tied also to its cultural land, right? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. Actually, absolutely, yes. The Yinatalushi, especially the Navajo version, it's powerful mm -hmm. only on its own land it once it steps away from the magic of the land it's on it becomes weaker and weaker and weaker so say one from arizona tried to go all the way up to like connecticut okay by the time it got to connecticut it had virtually no power left because that's not navajo okay. land the magic wasn't used on that land in the same way it wouldn't have the same strength and the same potency that it would when it comes back to arizona so i think a lot of people are going to start looking at that and knowing that the yinatalushi are a very, very specific thing. They need the Arizona land. This land is their magic. It is the source of their power. Without it, sure. they're no good. Would, would the same be said for like the Raven Mocker of the Cherokee? Yeah. Yeah, it has to stay within that isolated area because if it goes anywhere further, it no longer has any power. Okay. So let's go down this rabbit hole then. Traditional Cherokee land is here in Appalachia, but we all right. know through the history of our country, we displace them and move them to non-traditional lands, right? Mm -hmm. So right. Wh where would the Ravenmocker have its power? Here in the traditional lands? Or mm -hmm. does it follow the tribe land? As I was saying, does it have the power on the reservation because that's where the tribe is, the heart of the, the community, the, uh, the, the heart of the people? It would need the traditional lands where the magic originally began, where they were originally born. You know, I think a lot of people don't okay. understand how, how important tradition really is to all these tribes. You know, where they originated mm -hmm. from is really where all the power really is. You know, so if a raven mock okay. were just all over the tribes, who's to say that the other lands of the Cherokee were blessed with the same kind of magics? There's a chance they might not right. have been. So then the raven mock right. would be useless in a place that wasn't blessed with any magic. Okay. So it's it's tied specifically to the land, not just necessarily like the homeland, the motherland, so right. to speak, yeah. and not just necessarily where the tribe currently resides. Right. Correct. Now they they would they could still have a form of it, 
but it would be like like a shadow of its true power. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. One hundred percent. Okay. It's pretty awesome. interesting. So you start taking that down that rabbit hole. Oh, it is. It is. And that's 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 why I love what we do because when I can bring somebody on as knowledgeable as you, we can go down those rabbit holes. Yeah. Right? And, and yeah, stuff, absolutely. listen, this stuff is not easy out there to find, right? You have to dig and you've been digging on this stuff for a while. Oh yeah, a very long time. And man, I got so many dirty <laughs> from the uh, from the Navajo people here. Cause I was that brazen guy, Justin. I was that dude that would just walk up to people, and be like, Hey, tell me about the skinwalkers, and they just give me this look of you want to die? <laughs> You know, and I'm like, oh, oh. So I had to spend time with these people and, you know, show them that I intended to share their stories, not my story. I wasn't going to take the right. information, they gave me twist it, contort it and put it out there. No, I was going to take their story and tell their story as they told it, as their grandfathers told it, as their great grandfathers right. told it, I put out the actual information. So it took a very long time, but eventually they did start opening up to me. Sure. You know, and then I had guys like William Nighthawk, you know, he, he took me uh -huh. under his wing. He taught me so much stuff regarding skinwalkers and everything like that. I'm forever in his debt because of that. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think that, that's really important to get to the understanding of, and that's anything in the 14 subject. When we start talking about traditions and histories and, and cultural beliefs, we need to stay true to that and not muddy the waters and not put our yeah. own spin on them. Right. Because again, all that's going right. to do is confuse the issue. And that's what we're seeing nowadays. I, yeah. I can't tell you how many stories I've come across where they go, oh, I think I saw a skinwalker. Or, hey, I saw a skinwalker out my window. And, you know, it's some guy in Minnesota who thinks he may have seen a dog man, but it was a shadow. But he yep. saw red eyes. And the first thing he does is call it a skinwalker. And it's like, that, that's not even <laughs> like it just, it just irks me. It irritates me to no end. Oh, me too. I mean, Skinwalker became such a blanket term. You know, I mean, when people were seeing these like white, pale humanoids out there, they're like, oh, mm -hmm. Skinwalker. Yeah. Oh, it's where go. And it's like, why did we take these and make these blanket terms? You yeah. know, we didn't actually dig deep enough to say, oh, it's a pale humanoid. It's not a Skinwalker. You know, why did they ever think it was a Skinwalker? It doesn't it, make it's, sense. Um, it's buzzwords and lack of, of understanding, lack of information. Yeah. You know, it's probably it's a very popular subject. So when you put hashtag yeah. skinwalker, people are going to come view it, of course, you know, but right. you're not conveying facts. You're conveying something that's made up, you're misidentification again and again and again and again. And people are ignoring the lore and the facts are left behind and handed down to us. I think someone's yeah. got to step up and start putting the facts out there going, no, 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 no. This is what the people said. Exactly. So. Yes, I agree 100%. And that is actually the, the best point of why I wanted to do this show a hundred percent right there. Right. It's, awesome. And I'm seeing it in, in all different fields of research, whether it's UFOs, whether it's ghost hunting, um, yeah. paranormal entities, but you know, like the skinwalker, the Wendigo, Bigfoot, dog, man, it's becoming so convoluted. Yes. That, that people don't even know what they're talking about anymore. And the, the mm. sad thing is these people will argue with you. Oh about yeah, oh, it. trust me, I know. Oh my god. And, goodness, and, and they will literally sit there and you're trying to explain to them and be like, look, man, I, I you know, and, and you're not trying to pump yourself up, but like when I get in these arguments, I'm like, I've been studying this stuff for about 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And and I can't cite you because they're always like, Oh, can you cite me to a link or a website? I am the link, I am the website. <laughs> like I have right. done my due diligence on some of this stuff. So let, let me gently re-educate you on some of your misgivings here, you know, and they'll fight right. you tooth and nail. Yeah. They don't and it, it. it's absolutely no, because they want their, their truth to be the only truth or their reality to be the reality, you right. know, and it's absolutely frustrating to me. And there's been a couple times where I, I've just, I've, I've literally dropped out of so, certain social media groups because of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Me too. There's so many of them that I'm just like, you know what? Not even gonna waste my time. I'll just click leave the group. Yeah. Yeah, so. because you'll get the moderators jumping on you for arguing and causing dissension and everybody's opinion is a is a valid opinion. And it's like, no, no, it's not. The, the, right. That that is one of the biggest problems in the research field today is we're losing real researchers. Yeah, yeah. They're just you know All, being ignored or being shunned. It's it's terrible. Yeah. 
we, we have a field full of fans that aren't willing to do the research. Yep. And, and they only talk about what supports their own personal opinion, no matter how erroneous it is. Correct. You know, and, and a good example of this is somebody was citing the Zana case. If you're familiar with, with Zana, um, the almasty that was captured in, in Russia and the, 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 the people in the village, I got her drunk and raped her and had babies by her and all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, there was a full DNA study and a research team led by Igor Bertsev, Dr. Igor. Um, and they did a full DNA study. They found where she was buried. They got descendants of her. They did DNA tests on all of them, proved that they were all related. That's how they knew it was Zana's grave because it was unmarked, but it was rumored to be her grave. They dug right. up the bones, tested it against her, her son, Kewitt, and confirmed that it was his mother. And they were all 100% human. And, and they were um, sub-Saharan African is where Zanos came from. And then when you look into the, the culture, the region, and what was going on uh, geopolitically at the time, there was a lot of, of slave trade mm -hmm. routes through that area. And, and some of right. those slaves were coming from sub-Saharan Africa. So they tied it all together in a really neat package. This is what happened. This is what she was. She wasn't an almost She wasn't a Bigfoot. And I got into this argument with these people on this Facebook group because they were ending the story at there's going to be a DNA study. But of course. Zana's an all she's an almost And I said, well, but then the DNA study happened like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it's not like this just happened and they were misinformed. Like this happened 10 years ago. And it's funny because Dr. Igor was, was all about proving that Zana was an almost And he even came out and had to admit it wasn't, but the DNA right. showed us because that's what a researcher does. Like they follow the evidence. Right. And yeah. I got into this huge argument and they totally stopped the argument and said, well, you can believe whatever you want to believe. And it was like, it, it's not what I want to believe. It's this is the evidence as it played out. Like you're talking right. about something we already have case closed on. But they don't yeah. want to do that because that doesn't further their mystery anymore. It doesn't, you know, and it's insane. Yeah, you can't ignore a fact because you want to believe that something else is the truth. It doesn't work that way. Exactly. Not, not if we're going to be researchers. No, no. And it's like, you know, all these people that say they have like dog man attacking their house. Okay, uh -huh. maybe that's true. But if you have dog man attacking your house, how come there's never any photos of the damage this stuff does? You know, you never have any sure. videos of this thing messing up your house yet it comes and attacks your house every night where's the footage of it doing so then i mean outlandish claims need outlandish evidence don't they mm -hmm. yeah so, and that, know, that's so not to say it doesn't happen but at the same time you know if you're having repetitive stuff then let's document it let's do it you know let's you know let's get together let's film this let's see the proof that it's really happening and find a way to remedy this we can't do it just on your hearsay on your word it doesn't work that way right so and as soon as that, as soon as i win the, the one billion dollar uh powerball lottery next time it comes around i'll be able to do that <laughs> <laughs> all right any more questions from the audience on for you know for ryan about skinwalkers or wendigos or anything else brian come on i know you got more questions out there <laughs> No, that was pretty good questions I asked. So yeah. Oh yeah. They had some great questions tonight. They really did. Yeah. Well, there you know, if, if you take everything as a totality, there's a lot of misinformation out there, right? Oh so, yeah. uh, you know, I didn't know a difference between a raven walker and a skin walker. I didn't. Well, now so you do and knowing is half the battle. So yeah. yeah. Power is knowledge and knowledge is power. So yeah, absolutely. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. It took a long time uh, to learn, but you know, it was worth learning, though. Yeah, yeah well, it, it's puzzle pieces, right? You you learn a little piece of the puzzle as you go, and eventually, you can kind of start putting them together. Yeah, you know, and sometimes they fit. Sometimes you force them to fit, and then realize that you forced it, and it probably shouldn't have fit there in the first place. And that's just part of it. Yeah, that's true. You know. That's true. Be, being being willing to, to reassemble it and put it back together and reassemble it and put it back together until, you know, you yep. get a satisfactory, you know, concept. And then 
even then you might be the wrong picture. You might be looking at the backside instead of the front side. <laughs> That's, true. That's very true too. Yeah. Uh, the rake. He wants to know about the rake. Well, Brian, my uh, opinion about the rake is the rake itself, the name itself is a creepypasta, but there yep. is precedence for the rake. Now it goes back to when I was talking about those pale humanoids. Okay. Mm -hmm. People describe them as very aggressive with the black sunken eyes, hairless bodies. If you really think about it and break it down, that kind of looks like the rake, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So maybe we're seeing something, but they gave it, you know, the name, the rake, because that was created for, what was it? 4chan? I think that created the creepypasta for the rake. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it so was, yeah. um, yeah. So yeah, they're they, basically, they, if I remember correctly, they were kind of doing a competition in, in, in the same vein as they did the Slender Man. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, they, also, they, uh, it started yeah. with a Reddit post that said, let's make a monster. Yeah. And you that's, know, uh, again, again, where the rake came from. But, but it's right. funny, right? So it's kind of like history repeating itself. So they come out with this rake, and then all of a sudden people are going, wait a minute, I've actually seen that. Mm -hmm. Right. And to me, the, the, it's exactly the same thing that happened in Michigan with the Michigan Dog Man, where the radio DJ, they came up with a song about Michigan Dog Man, and then all of a sudden their phone board started lighting up saying, hey, we've seen this creature, and they're going, well, we just made this up. You couldn't have seen it. Right. But people are going, no, 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 I saw this like five years ago. I saw this 10 years ago. Yep. Same thing. Same thing. Yep. And it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating how that works. Well, the power of suggestion, too. I think a lot of people ignore that. The power of suggestion is incredibly at play here. You know, oh, we, yeah. create, we could create a new cryptid tonight, Justin. We could create this, like, believable monster. Put it out yep. there in a video saying, hey, we ran into this thing in the woods. By the next day, we're going to have a mailbox full of people going, oh, yeah, I saw this, too. I saw it, like, 20 years ago. I saw it, like, 50 years ago. This is yep. going to be a power of suggestion. So, Yep. And then as responsible researchers, we have to kind of weed through that and figure out or tr as best as we can yep. what is real and what isn't. And that's the challenge. That That's a real challenge for it. Yeah. It, it, really, it really is. is. We got to step up to that challenge and really start taking our field back. You know, I mean, yep. I hate to say it, but storytellers and hoaxers are taking over this cryptozoology field and it's so heartbreaking. Well, I got good news about that, right? So Microsoft is coming out with this software. Oh. But they are taking videos for the paranormal, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you can download it, and it will tell you if the video is real or fake. Oh. And it's, and it's taking all the layers. and nice. separating the ah. So nice. guess what, ladies and gentlemen? If you're not telling the truth, you are going to be busted. We can figure it out this fall. Hoaxers so I, beware. I stoked. Yes, I am stoked. That's awesome. So yes, yes. And it's really going to cripple the paranormal field. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, those AI hoaxes that people are passing around, it's yeah, terrible. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. listen. If, <laughs> if anybody believes those, I mean, I don't understand how you can look at one of those AI pictures and think it's real. I, I well, don't get it. There's no if to it, but, Justin. There's people that push that. Photo I know, I know there is. I know there it. is because I've seen it. I've seen it, but I can look at those pictures and go, "Well, that's a fake picture. That's not real. That's that's. I mean, Dude, CGI is what it is." Where, where y'all at? Look at Joe Biden. That ain't Biden, and people are still voting for his ass. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, Come on. I mean, I mean, he don't even know. I mean, I have psychics. I haven't even, I even caught my psychics off guard. Be like, they'll be in the middle of conversation. I'll be like, hey, is that Joe Biden? They're like, uh uh. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you asked that on the air. I'm like, I know, but I had to know. You know, and, and that guy that's playing Joe Biden don't even know who he is. Well, it's simple. You know, People will vote. What do you mean, hell to the queen? The damn bitch died over. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. People will yeah. believe what they want to believe. And if they want yep. to believe it, they will see evidence to believe what they want to believe. Yep. Simple as that. It, it's absolutely as simple. And that, I'm not saying everybody, but that's that's the nature of the sheep is yep. what it is. Correct. It's going to, it has its idea of what it wants to believe. And then it will focus on things that, 
basically build up that belief, whether it's truth or not, it doesn't even matter anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's a sad state of affairs. That, that really is. Yep, yeah. That's why we got to work at this field, man, and take it back and make it what it used to be, what it needs to be. I agree. I agree. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it on here, but I actually took a firsthand witness account of a pale crawler uh, from a girl I worked with. Oh, nice. Um, this would have happened about four years ago uh, in my area here, here in the Appalachian, the Smoky Mountains. Um, she was having a sleepover at a friend's house. And it was late at night, like midnight, maybe one in the morning. They were outside playing volleyball as teen girls are wont to do when they're having a sleepover and not sleep. And I, I can't quite recall who saw it first, but basically one of the girls had their back to the road and one of the girls was facing the road, right? So they were playing volleyball. So one's back to the road and the other one's facing playing back and forth. And they saw across the road in the tree line they saw this creature that had come out of the tree line and was watching them. Whoa. And she didn't know what it was. She just saw it. She told the friend, they turned around, looked at it and they ran into the house. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she described it exactly as we would expect a pale crawler, humanoid looking really pale skin, no hair, a creepy looking face. She couldn't give details. It was late at night. It was across the road, but she could tell I had a, wasn't right it wasn't normal it was very emaciated skeletal is how she had put it and then later on she yet completely nude from what she could tell um later on she looked online and because she didn't have a name for it she had never heard of anything like it and she started coming across pictures of what we now call the rake or you know as research we call them the, the pale crawlers or pale humanoids And she pulled one up on her phone and showed me, and she showed me this right here is what I found. What can you tell me about it? Whoa. She's like, because I I don't know anything about this, but what, this is what we saw. And then what can you tell me about it? And that tells me right there, this wasn't something that she saw on the internet. And all of a sudden was like, Oh, me and my girlfriend saw one. Yeah. This was something she, yeah. And then, it's weird because like I, I, I sport a lot of different paranormal gear and Bigfoot stuff. And so people are always asking me and she told me in confidence one time, I kind of had this weird thing happen, but I don't tell anybody. I said, well, you can tell me, you know, and she came out and told me and she was asking me about what this thing was. Wow. Like, what is it? Yeah. And, and that was the only, only one I've ever taken firsthand before. And this girl was wow. generally terrified of seeing it again. She never went back yeah. to her friend's house. For, See, for like a sleepover or anything. Anybody yeah. who sees these pale humanoids, they're always terrified of them. They never want to see them again. That's really interesting. I wonder what it is about. Yeah. Them. Oh, what I think it has to do with, with the uncanny valley theory, is what I think it is. Personally. Yeah, could, be. could be. I mean, yeah. I took a couple of reports here in Arizona. So, you know, and both people I've spoken to, they don't ever want to see it again either. So definitely something to it. Yeah. I wouldn't want to look at it either. <laughs> I don't blame. I, I, I would have set the damn woods on fire. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. But Brian's I wanna, asking. I want to oh, thank you ahead. for your time and everything. I know it's getting late, but I know Brian. Uh, what, what has he got? He says, uh, "Yeah, finally a way to bust uh, the hoaxer." It is, and I, I'm, I'm yeah. glad Microsoft came out with it. So. Yeah, thank goodness for Microsoft. Kudos yeah. for you guys. Yes. Yeah. Brian's got one more question in there. And the only reason I really want to get to it is because we touched on it earlier. Can you pull oh. that one up there? Where I is see it? it. There you go. Uh, okay, you know, so that is that is what we mentioned earlier, Brian, when we referenced the Tulpa. Yep. Uh, the Tulpa is an idea that if enough people or a person with a strong enough mental capacity focuses on something, an entity, you know, for our purposes, it could manifest itself in some form in the physical world. Yeah, it's almost that's like the mind idea over of a Tulpa. It's mind over now, matter. They don't mind and we don't matter. Yeah, right. <laughs> I've done a little research this on this. And what I found is something very interesting. P- 
people always credit um, the Tibetan monks with the yes. idea of the tulpa. The yep. tulpa. But again, this is another thing that I think we as Westerners have bastardized. Okay. Because originally a tulpa was not a physical manifestation of a thought form. No. The idea of tulpa is when you're in meditation and you have an image fixed in your mind that you're meditating and focusing on. That right. image is the tulpa. It's not something that specifically manifests in the physical world that other people can see. That Correct. is a concept that we have taken and just kind of run away with it. Now, that doesn't mean it's not possible. It's just going back to the roots of what a tulpa actually was. It was a meditation technique, something they referred to in their meditations of focusing on something to the point where it becomes real in your mind. Um, and, and not saying that there is not some kind of, um, not telekinetic, but some kind of mind power, you know, ESP that could project that thought power for some people. So they could be perceived like a hologram, but that's not intentionally what a tulpa was or, or how it's originally referred to as. Wow. You covered all the bases there, Justin. <laughs> I, I try. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm big. I'm a nerd, man. I'm big about knowledge. And when I, when I seek something, I try and find the truth. And it's not the truth as I want it. It's the truth as it sits in reality. Yeah. The fact, you know, the right. Yep. So yeah. people talk a lot about tulpas and all they hear is, Oh, if people enough, enough people think about it. We can make it happen, which is what they yep. say. The slender man was is a tulpa. Right. But that's right. not the idea of a tulpa. That's not what it originally was. No. Not saying that, you know, the, the power of manifestation is not a real thing. I believe it is a real thing. It's just yeah. tulpa is not the word for it. Yeah, we got to think of another word for that. We really do. Yeah. It, it reminds me of Monsters, Inc., where it talks about, it picked me up with his mind powers and shook me like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but That's funny. I just want to answer that question for Brian real quick, because we had brushed on the topic uh, a little bit earlier in the conversation. Brian was loaded with questions tonight, man. I'm impressed. Yeah. Brian, you are topic. now you are now required to come on every one of my shows, okay? Like uh -oh. everyone. Uh -oh. <laughs> See Brian, where, you where, yourself, bro. Where were you on my question and answer night, Brian? <laughs> He's a good guy. Good topic. Good yep. topic. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Brian, right. I can't thank you enough for coming on such last minute for me. Hey, um, my yeah, I had asked you and another guy who finally answered me, our guest for next week. I'm really excited about too. Ryan, you probably know him. Um, Daniel, I can never remember his whole name. Daniel Allen Jones, right? Yeah. The, the yep. UFO guy. Um, yep. We're finally going to have an episode on UFOs, guys. I know I've been promising one. Uh, no, Daniel you. is the man on UFOs. I met Daniel last year at the Mothman Festival, the same place. I met Ashley, who was in our audience earlier. I don't know if she's still there. I met Ashley there as well. Um, so I'm excited to have Daniel on next week. We're going to talk UFOs That's and awesome. get to the bottom of that. Um, I'm still working on lining up our one guest about talking about the back recording and the back talking, back masking and speech. Um, he is a local musician and he is booked for like the next 60 days straight. So he, he's telling me if he gets a day booking on a Thursday and he can make a nighttime, he'll let me know. So that may be a last minute pop in. There's Ashley. Um, I'm excited about that. Um, I have another guest who is trying to be in an area on a Thursday where he has signal. My good friend, Matthew Delph, who oh, nice. goes by bad, badass monster hunter. Matt is a very good friend of mine. Um, known him for years. We've done events together and stuff. He's going to come on and we will go down some serious rabbit holes with him. Um, awesome. We'll have to see what he can talk about and what he can't talk about guys, because he has done some um, top secret work. And so there's Ooh. stuff that he can and can't divulge and he gets in all kinds of crazy stuff. So I'm excited to have him on. 
we got some good stuff lining up, guys. We're going to have some great, great discussions here moving forward. And I'm working on some research myself. So some nights we're not going to have a guest. We're going to come up with a couple different topics to kind of delve down some things I don't think you guys have heard about before. Um, one of my favorite ones, and I'll just pull the spoiler out there. Uh, one of the first things I researched back and I was looking into weird stuff was Victor, the talking budgie and a budgie is a parakeet. So Victor, the parakeet, not only just mimicked words, he was actually a sentient bird that could carry on conversations and have meaningful conversations in discourse. So I'm pulling up information on Victor, the talking budgie, and we'll have a whole show on him. And if it's real, if it was a hoax, we'll get into the whole thing. So guys, keep tuned in the coming weeks and months coming up. We're going to have some amazing shows to go down. And I'm, I'm really excited for what's going to happen. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Ryan, thank you once again. And My for pleasure. coming on, I appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, from coast to coast around the world, that's a wrap. Good night. And God, y'all have a fantastic night. Bye bye.